Right, there we go. Hello. Uh, welcome to this uh, Cometric webinar, uh, Mastering Global Media Analysis, Best Practices for Comms and Reputation Measurement. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt Couchman. I'm a senior consultant at Cometric, and we're over the moon to be joined by some fantastic guests today in Elisa and Florian. Uh, guys, I'm going to give you the full uh, intro that you so richly deserve in just one moment. Um, just to set um, a bit of context, um, hopefully if you're joining us today uh, for this webinar, you already have an idea of the media intelligence sector in which Cometric operates. Um, if you don't, put very simply, we work for communications professionals in helping them really track, measure, and understand their earned media landscape and their brand reputation. What are some of those narratives surrounding their brands and their companies? What is the level of uh, editorial bias and opinion that's being offered to them? Uh, and it's really interesting sector um, in that we've got such a diverse array of clients, um, all of whom have a comms output and have a need to understand what's being said about them. And this can be from pharma, to automotive, to NGOs, or indeed to the tech mobility sector, which segues me neatly onto introducing our two guests today, who are going to spend some time with us over the next sort of 40, 45 minutes, sharing their experiences, their thoughts on media measurement, uh, the media insight services that they've been receiving, how they've worked, especially across both a new sector or relatively new sector in the grand scheme of things and across multiple markets. So guys, welcome, Elisa and Florian. Thank you so much for joining us. Elisa, I shall start with you. Um, Elisa Pasculi, sorry, get that wrong. The Head of External Affairs for Measurement and Insights at Didi. Now, just to introduce Didi, Didi Global is one of the world's leading mobility tech platforms. Uh, offering a range of app-based services across markets, across Asia Pacific, Latin America, Africa, including ride hailing, taxi hailing, chauffeuring, carpooling, uh, other forms of shared mobility that uh, Didi offers as well, and also do things such as auto solutions, food delivery, intercity freight and financial services. So an awful lot of things that the Didi app can offer. Uh, Didi's mission is to build, build a better journey. And currently the company, uh, often referred to as China's Uber, it's a really simple way of thinking about it, it's probably how I think about it, uh, operates in 15 international markets. Elisa herself, um, Elisa and her team lead the global intelligence strategy and reputation management for Didi for the communications and governmental affairs team. Um, Elisa's also spent nine years at a a little tech company, I think they're called Google. I think I've heard of those guys. Uh, that's where we come across each other. So huge experience and delighted, Lisa, that you're joining us today. Definitely my pleasure, like an honor to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. No, the only not. thing you forgot to say is that I am Brazilian. So I apologize in advance for my awkward accent and for eventually probably small mistakes in English, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Well, in that case, I should apologise for my overtly British accent whilst we're here. Um, sound like I'm from Downton Abbey. Um, Florian, though, equally pleased to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Uh, Florian Anders is the head of corporate comms at Tier Mobility. Tier Mobility is the world's leading micro mobility provider, providing uh, people with a range of shared light electric vehicles, from e scooters to e bikes, to help cities reduce their dependence on cars. Uh, TIR's mission is to change mobility for good, and TIR is now present in 560 cities across 31 markets, making TIR the largest multimodal micro-mobility operator globally. And yes, I have practiced saying that earlier. Uh, that was on your website, so Florian, that's down on you. Uh, Florian and his team drive effective communications uh, for TIR around the world, strengthen their reputation globally. Uh, he's responsible for driving collaboration across all new and existing tier markets. And previous to his time at Tier, Florian was at Lime, uh, another brand that some of us may be aware of. We've seen the Lime scooters whizzing around London. So again, a wealth of experience to share with us today. So Florian, thank you so much for being here. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. And thanks for colour coordinating you two. Looking really <laughs> smart. I look like the odd member of a boy, but well, pop band or something in my blues. 
Thanks so much. Now, it's not about uh, Cometric or about me today, obviously, it's about you two guys. We really want to understand some of your um, experiences in media measurements across global markets within your sector. So starting off really top level, and then we can go down to some more detailed um, responses as we go. Oh, and just to mention, if anyone's watching this with the chat function, if anyone has a question as we go along, please feel free to ping it over in the chat. We can see it. You might not be able to, but we can see these as these pop up. So anything at all, please do send it. We can see if we've got time to pull that out and throw these throw your questions back over to these guys. But starting off, big, big top level, Elisa, if we go ladies first and we start with you, um, in your sector, being that it's still fairly new in the grand scheme of, uh, of, of, of corporate business, uh, what are some of the key communications challenges that you guys have faced and what's the bigger role that media analytics has played to either manage these or hopefully solve some of these problems? Yeah, I feel that, well, it's, I think it's applicable to any sector, to be honest, like it's a challenge for the comms uh, departments, right? I feel it's necessary for us to have some intelligence and some data guidance so that you can inform your comms strategies better. Um, so you mentioned early like brand reputation, understanding what your key issues, obviously being super at tune for crisis management. So making sure that you're being alerted uh, in time and that you have the intelligence to act fast and make informed decisions. So I think that those are the like two main use cases, mm. but basically just giving us uh, a little bit of uh, benchmark and data to inform your next steps rather than just guts. Mm. Making informed decisions. I think that's a buzzword I've used so often in, in the intelligence mm -hmm. sector. It, it's about having the, the, the data to actually know that this is a right decision. Um, Florian, what, where, what's your take? What's some of the challenges that TM Mobility has faced? And uh, how do you use analytics? What's your approach? Plenty of challenges for sure. First of all, um, yeah, I can only echo what Elisa said. So, although working in a relatively new sector, the key comms challenges are pretty similar to, to more established industry. Um, I have to say, so regardless of the sector, as a comms leader, it is crucial to keep track of the news and develop like in this fast paced industry that with rapid expansion of the business, uh, we have to safeguard the company's reputation. Um, and we do all of that with very limited resources. So how has media analysis helped me to understand and tackle the internal and the external challenges? Um, I picked four challenges that I would like to share with you. So oh, first of all, uh, um, I think scarce resources. Uh, all of us are working with very limited resources. So Cometrix Media Analysis has really helped me to better understand where and how to allocate my resources um, and maximize the impact and the outcome across all markets. Um, and especially as T is very much and has always been very much relying on external resources with agencies being the local point of contact and press office in the markets. Secondly, um, shared micromobility, especially e-scooters, are a very controversial topic and of high interest. So not only that we unfortunately have to deal with accidents on a regular basis, but also like sh constantly showcasing our efforts to improve safety, sustainability, accessibility, all of that. And to, to balance out the rather negative media sentiment, we have to push extra hard and promote the benefits of shared e-scooters. Um, so a lot of what we do on a daily basis is actually trial and error. We do many things for the first time and then of course we have to evaluate, did they actually work? Did they have an impact or not? So as I always say, we build the plane while flying. Hmm. Thirdly, I would say it's one of the key challenges is planning insecurity. So we struggle a lot with planning and my planning horizon is usually two to four weeks um, due to many reasons, external factors like when will the city announce the tender results and um, internally speaking, ever changing launch dates and timelines. So um, like when we look on at year over year or even month over month comparisons that are not a suitable solution for us, 
um, if the size of the company is doubling every six to 12 months. Um, and therefore, did, we decided to yeah, uh, work with you and set uh, different KPIs to actually then uh, track and have unbiased and most of all accurate data and insights. And lastly, it's also about showcasing the impact COMS is having. Um, needless to say that we are, just like Elisa said, a mobility tech company. We are very data-driven. So media analysis helped me very much with showcasing the impact that we as a COMS teams are having. And that, in the end, helped me to secure additional budget and additional resources. So overall, I was able to grow the team and the network of agencies. Anything that can make means you can go and get additional budget is, is always going to be a, a fantastic bonus. Um, yeah, or and, savings. Sorry, Matthew. Just no, to like, add into, may I add into something? Because I thought it was very interesting. One example of like showing the impact uh, for of the communication teams back to the company um, that I feel that data like analytics really, really helps is to see if your efforts are actually matching what the business really needs. So I feel it's like giving this argument, like data arguments back to the business are like, yeah, we, we said that we're going to preach that we are a sustainable company and that's our core value. So is that being reflected on media? So are we lending the messages uh, that we said we would? And this is helping the brand reputation to go in the direction that the business decided that it would go, right? I feel that that's a key thing. Uh, it's a key challenge, but it's also like a key benefit, right? From actually do doing very well done. Uh, yeah, and it's it's something that we always advocate as well is helping guys like you showcase your comms and how it's supporting the central business proposition of your company. Uh, and for many years, I've used a, an analogy about going into the boardroom where you can have the sales team can go to a boardroom with their sales figures and the marketing team have got their data, HR have got their data. What data can the comms team bring in to say, this is what we're doing. It's supported the central business and we're doing it really well. Um, and Florian, it's really interesting actually with your uh, detailed overview is that you do mention planning, uh, planning ahead as to what's happening and some of those emerging narratives as well. Um, and it's something that we, we can sometimes lose track of with measurement is that measurement feels like it's always going forward, but don't be afraid to well, look back to do some benchmarking, but then plan effectively uh, before you really release a campaign or before you have a new strategic press release. Look at what's happening and really have that full 360 overview measurement start doesn't just start after you've done the event and then you're looking back. So it's great that you, you, you're on board with that as well. Um, and moving on from that, so it's it's clear it's it's very important. It helps you showcase to the wider businesses exactly what the comms team are doing and keeping on top of those emerging narratives in a new industry, which is crucial. You know, we can kind of second guess other industries where the stories are going, where is micro mobility going? But when you get that insight in, what are some of the main KPIs that you use to actually really measure the comms performance? There's so many metrics out there. I'm always really keen to hear from guys like yourself. What are you really using? Uh, yeah. Sorry, let's go Florian. <laughs> Happy to start. So we picked three key KPIs. Um, first one being share of voice. So, I mean, uh, needless to say, we want to be the loudest, the most recognized player in a very competitive market. Secondly, media sentiment. For me, that's an indicator of the proactiveness um, of comms in that market. Um, so the benchmark here is not to have more than 10% of negative articles. Um, and the third key KPI being spokesperson visibility. For me, this is a great indicator for quality media coverage. Um, so 10% of all articles should include a quote from a tier spokesperson. Um, important to say this is based on a set media panel. So we defined a panel of 20 to 50 key media outlets per market, depending on the market size. Um, and not just like monitoring all online media out there, mm. but those are the three uh, main KPIs we're using. And it's almost going to a secondary question, but before I ask that, actually, if I would throw that to Elisa, what are your, some of your main KPIs that you use in your reporting? It's amazing because like it's a building up um, on Florian's KPIs. Those are the three bases as well. 
I just like, so beyond like share a voice, I have five pillars that then have a waiting mechanism so that it will have one score in the end. So I'll have like one metric that will reply back to my leadership and that represents how healthy uh, is the coverage that we're getting. Uh, so we use the same methodology for uh, comp competition tracking as well and brand, brand reputation. But the pillars of this uh, score are the same KPIs. So we look uh, at presence, so share of voice included, so how loud we are, tonality, taking into consideration, uh, press sentiment, the pillar of media as well. We do look uh, at a selective or the media that we believe are the most important for mm -hmm. the business strategy, not necessarily just like top tier one media, because that really, we, we really want to go deeper into the media that are important for the business. Uh, and then we have two extra pillars, one looking at content. So not only looking at what this, how many stories we have, but what the story is about, right? Because I don't want to have a massive share of voice and that being all negative or, uh, I don't know, incidents, coverage, right. right? So we really care about if we're talking, we are fair lending stories that are about topics that matter for us. And the fifth and last pillar is effort. So also connected to the tonality bit that you have in your KPI forum, but looking at uh, what drove that story, right? Were we proactive? Were we reactive? Was there something that organically came up? And in this pillar, we also take uh, we take into consideration one uh, indicator called message cut through. So to see, similar to the spokes, spokes, spokes people mentioned, but to see if the message that we wanted actually landed on that story. So um, that's a very detailed, it's a model that we developed internally but it spits out one number, right? It's uh, something that we look over time and it has been very helpful to give us benchmarks of healthiness across markets, right? And also gives other local teams uh, flexibility because they control their media landscape, mm -hmm. right? So the media pillar is related to them. Uh, also the um, uh, effort side, right? It will depend on the size of our team and our resources in each uh, market so that's that's how we have been doing but yeah, i think the key metrics are the same <laughs> and, and it's really interesting as well that the key metrics are all based on the actual content analysis of what's being said more so than just some some more uh, metadata and one thing i was thinking of maybe a bit of a sub question to that is how important is it for you to have reach figures or audience figures in your reporting. For someone like me that's been in the sector for <clears throat> 20 years, it's always been the thing as to how many people are looking at this. Uh, but where, now when we're focusing such on, and you both have key media lists, these are the titles we want to appear in. So we know we're hitting them, we want to know what the stories are and how we're being positioned. How important is it to actually have audience figures? Or is that a metric which maybe in global multi-market analysis isn't as crucial as it perhaps it used to be? Uh, Florian, do you want to, what's your take on that? Sure. Personally, I think it makes more sense to establish KPIs that measure quality, not quantity, mm -hmm. but it very much depends on your goals, uh, your target audience and what you're trying to achieve. So um, reach can be a useful metric when you work in an early stage startup where your primarily goal is to create brand awareness. Um, but in my case, um, I would say quality over quantity and therefore reach is nice uh, but as we target city officials decision makers it's for me it's most important that those people actually read the article that we generated hmm. like getting through to the right people not the masses i think exactly. in your case is that similar to your take elisa yeah i i think it's a pretty similar take um when you're talking about like brand reputation and like corporate right but again to flores point if you are thinking of more product comms, for example, then uh, I'm not completely against it, right? But what I would say is key is for you to choose one supplier. <laughs> and if that's so that you have one indicator, right? Giving mm -hmm. you the right numbers if you choose to use reach. Uh, but I feel like similarly to social echoing and 
social shares and engagement. Uh, once I was attending a training and someone said like vanity metrics and that really stuck with me, right? Because it can be very tempting to just use those big numbers, right? Mm. Uh, as vanity metrics to say, oh yeah, we reach like two billion people. And then they say like, oh, but we don't, we're, so it's the full half of the world, right? So you, you have to pay attention. So my tip would be, if you choose to use reach as one of your indicators, right? Not main KPI, but to choose one supplier that will give you this consistency uh, of reference across markets and that you balance it out so that you can, for example, take the population of your country or the population of your target uh, or, or your, your target audience and then like minimize that so that you just don't end up reporting on billions and billions of meaningless. Uh, Absolutely. Numbers. Absolutely. And it's a good point about consistency as well. I think a point that some people uh, lose sometimes is that it, it's not really about accuracy to the to the nearest hundred people that viewed this website. If you're consistently measuring it, it's about what changes from one month to another. If it's the same methodology, it doesn't matter if 32,000 people read this or 45,000. It's just the, the peaks and the troughs and what's, what's changed, what's different. Um, but interesting to just yeah, to, to see or take it. I think it's not a metric that's going away and it's improving with um, uh, actual article level readership on many platforms that you can have these days. Um, but going actually back to the, the point you made there as well about different populations across different markets. So another reason why reach and audience figures can be not as useful when you're operating across multiple markets. Um, but you, as you both do, though, you both have um, activities in, in many different countries. So how do you use the analytics then to actually measure cross market performance and campaigns? And what, what are some of the pitfalls there that you need to be aware of from your perspective? Uh, at least I'll, I'll throw that one to you. I feel like starting to the, the similarly to the reach answer, right? I feel you have to create standards and like benchmarks that are representing the reality of each market, right? So what if you are to define in your media list, what is a tier one, you should apply a, a criteria that defines tier one, but that is uh, honest to that market's reality and then not apply the same rule for everyone, right? Because mm. countries have different populations and different media landscapes. So it's more like looking at, um, we agreed that is, let's say a tier one would be your uh, 10 um, mainstream media that has national wide um, audience. And I don't know, like, you can agree on your criteria, right? So then you would search for those in your specific market. So the, the rule is the same, but adaptable to that reality, to yeah. that reality. So I think that that would be something. And I feel um, that the habit of benchmarking. So benchmarking that country to that to themselves mm. rather than to the other countries, right? So because yeah. every reality will be different. So really looking back and seeing, okay, what was a very good campaign that we did in the past for that country? What were the results that we had? Then this a big crisis that we had, the results that we had, and then over time you will get something like mm. benchmark against absolutely, your yeah. your country, specific country. Not sure yeah. if that's good though. No, absolutely, and it's a it's a good point there about benchmark a country to themselves. Uh, and I've worked on many global reports and it took a while to learn, I think, when you're presenting the data, make sure that a country is just looking at their own KPIs and their own activity. No one will thank you for benchmarking German activity to France, to Britain, to, because of the different populations, the different uh, media landscapes there. So, but it's a tricky one to do when operating, as I'm sure maybe you've come across this, when you're feeding back to the markets, there may be that level of, well, are you looking at us in the same light as these guys? Because that's unfair. So it's a bit of a, a balancing act, I think, when it comes to analytics there. Uh, Florian, what, what's your experiences with, with that, uh, handling that, that cross-market insight? Um, pretty similar to Lisa's experience, I have to say. Um, when I look back, uh, very often it, it was about, yeah, setting up 
uh, a new market. So it was, we're launching in Slovakia in four weeks. And so I was looking for an agency and with very little or no knowledge of the media landscape in some of the markets that we launched, um, I wanted to provide or set KPIs, provide a framework that works for both new markets, but also for more mature markets. Um, and yeah, to give the market as much freedom as they need to adapt to their market needs. And also, uh, of course, the possibilities, because not all of the markets have, let's say, mobility trade media outlets. Hmm. Um, so my tip would be uh, to have some kind of bottom up strategy. So I was working very closely with the market managers and the local agencies. It's like, um, and the first step was always defining the top tier media outlets, as I said, 20 to 50 media outlets, um, addressing decision makers, the city officials, and like, that's what matters. Um, and then the focus was clear from the beginning. And I think that made our work in the markets also more effective because it was very clear, straightforward, that's the goal. Those 20, 30, 40, 50 media outlets are the one that matters and the rest uh, is not that important. Mm. Um, and may I just add one something that I feel maybe mm. important to share with me, but uh, I feel like the difference for me coming from Google to like from big tech, right, to mobility was that it's a hyper, it, it can be a hyper local, um, product, right? Like mm. the, the service that we provide is hyper local. So it's at the city level. And sometimes you tend to think of PR as this national wide, like we're launching a country, but I've, maybe that's like pivoting slightly into a strategy, but it will influence the, the media strategy, right? And the media, the, the weight that you're giving to the media list, right? So sometimes going hyper local and really looking at like, okay, who do we want to read? Who do you want to influence? Uh, so if it's on a city level, then there might be not no so traditional, uh, not as big media, and not not necessarily industry um, outlets, but that are relevant to that state or that municipality, and that that can be your top tier for that strategy, right? Yeah. Absolutely. We, we have a lot of local newspapers, very local or regional media outlets in that list because that's what matters to the people in York or some German villages. And that's in the end what they read, not like some business or trade media outlets. That's an amazing point you make, actually, because when you think about global comms strategy, you think, OK, it's at this top, top high level. Of course, you guys are doing this. But on a city level, which then requires a hyper local approach, so you're almost having a global hyper local strategy to, to, to make sure people are aware of of Tier and Diddy in those cities. So that's uh, and Florian, you, you, you touched there actually on how you spent a lot of time talking to local agencies and to the local Tier offices to try and coordinate. So has it actually? Or is it beneficial? Perhaps what are some of the challenges to having a third party data provider coming into that mix? Because you've already got a lot of stakeholders there. And there's a lot of tools internally, uh, which we know you can use. What's been your, your experience there um, with, with bringing third party data to that, to, that, uh, to that model? Sure. So for me, it brings, first of all, it's convenient and it gives me peace of mind. And that's very important. Um, secondly, I think it's also one of the key benefits is that we have reliable and unbiased data and insights, because based on my experience, some agencies tend to over-report their successes, so no offense to my dear agency friends, but um, it's very good to have actually a third party doing the job, um, and that as a result also frees up time and resources for my team and my agency network to be more proactive, uh, to reach out to the media, to talk to journalists, because that's in the end what they are doing best and also enjoy the most. So I would say it's a win-win-win, like um, I have my peace of mind, the agencies can focus on other things, and I have a great report that I can trust. 
We, we won't tell them you said that, Floyd, don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's between us, all amongst friends. Uh, Elisa, what's been your experiences? What's your thoughts? Yeah, I cannot say anything else rather than what Florian just said, like echo every bit of it. I feel the unbiased review is the most important thing. Uh, and also the giving giving back to the agency some sort of intelligence, right? Rather than them looking at their own work, which I feel it's so it's so powerful to some extent, right? Like, hey, here is like you put a lot of effort into this. You just like tracked all the analytics of it. We're gonna give back to you so that you can look at the insights and see what you can do differently. So yes, yeah, a huge resource uh, savings and and unbiased review. So I feel that's that's key. Fantastic. Um just uh, I could probably circle back to a couple of points in my notes here because we've got a, a sort of like a, a final question coming up. I'm keen to keep this quite short. I know we could all have death by webinars uh, if we're not careful. So we'd like to keep this one quite short and punchy. So um I should circle back very quickly before the last question, uh, going back to KPIs. So that really interests me, and again, because we'd love to hear from clients on how you actually use the data. Uh, it's no point offering everything on a plate. We want to know what, what works for you guys. When you settle on your KPIs, how difficult was it to get buy-in from your actual stakeholders or the C-suite? Because I'm always very conscious that it may be great for you, your data people, you can understand this. When you then have to communicate it up the chain to the C-suite, was there any hurdles there was there any uh, pushback from there or, or what could, could even the insight sector play a role in helping to educate uh, about the metrics internally so that becomes an easier path uh, i don't know if you guys any any had any um experiences with that elisa you want to start yeah i feel like well both of us probably are coming from like tech companies and mobility companies that are heavily data driven so i feel that were they were more like embraced rather than uh pushed uh right from like leadership to some extent so it's good to be able to to report back to your earlier point matthew on like okay other areas like sales and marketing are super used to have mm -hmm. some uh numbers and, and uh, kpis to report on right so i don't feel there was a lot of resistance what I do feel that, uh, and that's like previous experience, it's the building up internally and getting the buy-in from the full comms teams in all the different markets so that everyone can reach an agreement on, okay, this actually represents our work. Mm -hmm. um, I think was the time that took a little bit more buy-in. And of course, it's kind of expected, right? You have to make sure that everyone agrees and, and to what you are report on 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 what you are reporting on. Mm. Uh, so I feel that that's that's at least on my experience that's where we were. Is, is that similar to, to you? Flo? I guess being tech based, that that should be an easier uh, an easier sell for you guys, right? Yes and no. So when I joined here a little bit over two years ago, I was actually surprised that there was not really a like reporting process in place. Um, the people had a very good understanding of what they want, but just because everyone was so focused on expansion and growing the business, it wasn't just a priority. So I was in a very lucky position and um, to completely free how to like set up everything, which I loved. And starting point for me was just like uh, the understanding of the needs of my key stakeholders, which is firstly being informed about like what's going on in the world. And secondly, as Elisa said, measuring the impact. So um, to keep my stakeholders and a leadership team informed, we set up a curated morning report with the latest news about tiers and the main competitors coming into our inboxes every morning. Everyone loved it. And then secondly, measuring the impact um, was a little bit more challenging, uh, but then we were pretty much free. I was free to do whatever I want or felt was right. And then actually everyone liked it. And so it was quite an easy and smooth process. And then I think people actually appreciated that there was data before they asked for it. Um, so that was great. 
yeah and, and it goes to the everyone has to be a data analyst these days and it's throughout every department from hr through to whoever it may be um everyone has to have their uh data goggles on um very quick question actually uh we've had one posted uh from ahmed um so we've got a few minutes before the one last question so i thought i'd throw this out it's quite an interesting one how often do you guys need to rescope your analysis and what informs your decision to do that so great question Ahmed. thank you so much for posting that um what's the typical cycle of uh when you feel need to sit down and go are we still actually do we have a brief which is fit for the current purpose uh Elisa, how, how often would you say that's something that's you have to uh, revisit? like i would say it's very like almost every quarter we we do look at like we do quarterly reports and we do half years and uh full year reports and those are great moments to see like because we're looking at the trends and say okay are we still monitoring the most important issues of the industry it's a fairly new industry so it's ever changing uh, so yeah, we I, we do think and rescope monitoring to some extent um, every quarterly report. Uh, some things are cons uh, consistent, right? Um, but also because we have uh, blooming um, competition as well, right? So new competitors emerge in every market. Uh, so we do have to update that. Are we still looking at the the top? The, the top competition mm. beyond just top trendy key issues or, or important areas. Yeah, those pesky competitors, they, they're always popping up everywhere, aren't they? It's, it, uh, well, you've it's got to keep it. your eye on them and keep the brief updated. But it's a, I guess it's a balance between keeping the brief updated but not losing the ability to benchmark on where you've already been. Uh, so so you, you keep that uh, data validity there. Florian, how about yourself? How often do you say you need to sort of really Think about the scope and scale of the analysis based on my experience not very often i think the biggest chunk of work is really setting up the markets from agreeing on the top tier media list to getting um yeah all the tag words right listing the competitors and um I mean, of course, on a constant basis, we have to check, am I still monitoring the right outlets? What happened to the competitive landscape in that market? Because, I mean, operators come and go. Um, but it's, as Elisa said, small amendments on a regular basis. But I would say if, if you do a good job in setting up the market for success, um, that's, that's uh, yeah, the big, biggest chunk of work. Yeah, consistent tweaks rather than a huge yeah. rescoping. Yeah. I think but is the keep uh, an eye. Yeah, like you have to keep an eye because it will always change. And we were talking about uh, the other day with the Cometric oh. team about relevancy checks, right? Because uh, beyond press, slightly uh, less, but on social chatter, the way that people talk about a subject evolves with language, right? So you, you have to maintain monitoring up to date to make sure that you're actually capturing, capturing relevant uh, conversations. Mm. Um, so yeah, I would say quarterly review, it's good, not to read code completely. Yeah, absolutely. To make sure that you're bringing in everything that is relevant. That makes perfect sense. So, just looking at the time, the, the last question, um, which I would, I'd like to throw to you guys, and it, it, it's one of those classic end of the webinar questions, but from a measurement perspective, what data set is important to you in 2023? And I say that because it's the sort of drop the dead donkey question, but we're always curious to, to ask as well. What one KPI or stat really stands out for you in 2023? Uh, Florian, what, what, what do you think? It always takes me back to like the buzzword of impact coverage. So I think what I would love to be able to track or track more accurately in the future is like, are my opinion leaders, my decision maker in the industry, um, engaging with the media, with the articles, um, that could be a blog post, a tweet, a press release, or an article that we secured um, or do they even amplify my stories and it, that in comparison to my competitors. So how much are we 
influencing their thinking, their decision making, um, again, targeting decision makers and city officials. Uh, it's nice to have a big article in a renowned region in newspaper whatsoever, but it doesn't really count if your target audience doesn't read that media outlet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and secondly, Elisa, uh, Elisa touched base on it. So social echo. So the way we consume media has changed drastically over the past few years. So we don't read this or that magazine or newspaper. It's like um, we based what algorithms think we're interested in or what our friends and peers share with us on, on Slack and WhatsApp. So again, creating interesting and shareable content and tracking if the article is getting traction or not, I think will become more and more important uh, this year, next year, and in the future. Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's always mo moving the needle again from, let's just start looking at outputs and what was the actual outcome of our activity? And if it's through blogs, if it's through generating content that you're putting out there and how are people are interacting with that. Uh, Elisa, where are you on that? What, what stands out in 2023 for Diddy's comms? Uh, not to fatigue you, but like I feel overall, right? Like for me, oh, and, we, yeah. and like me and Flora when we were talking previously about this, I do feel like this echoing bit, like where people are sourcing their news, because the behavior of getting information, it's it's humane, right? Like we're always gonna get news, but we don't know exactly where this influence is coming from. So I feel in terms of a data analytics, um. What is super where I would like to come ne next and have some uh, understanding on is mm. okay where where the people that I need to read the news are sourcing their news are they being influenced more through like yeah top tier magazines mainstream or is like the the telegrams and the whatsapps and the social and the social like the official social media channels, the ones that are actually uh, getting the people that I need to influence attention, right? So mm. I think this uh, analysis of the influence of, I don't like this term, but like dark social, but uh, how dark social, social and traditional media uh, in, interconnect. Yes. Uh, and what influences, um, what drive the change first. Uh, I think that's where we should be all looking at, to be honest. And uh, other formats, right? And I think that's very like basic to say, but the power of audio, the power of video consumption mm -hmm. uh, and the shift uh, on like to TikToks and to short formats and like podcasts, I feel that there's a, we should be looking at that as well and have better tracking for for those formats yeah yeah absolutely it um it, it kind of echoes a question that we've been posted actually about where do we see the evolution in the industry going in the next 12 months and lisa i think you just you hit on so many nails there podcasts uh a greater understanding of the changing media consumption habits of our consumers per market and that's a tricky one uh, you know, I, I've certainly done it on a domestic level in the UK, but for you guys having multi-market approach, understanding the subtle changes and the cultural differences, uh, you know, we still have a very different media landscape in Germany to the UK, for example. It's drilling down to get that finite detail there as to what, what really works, where do I need to be? Um, there's certainly a, a lot of scope for continued growth in the insight sector, absolutely. Great. Um, we are coming up to one minute to the 45 minutes. That absolutely flew past. I've no idea where that went. Um, there's uh, any other final points from, from, from you two before we wrap it up? Uh, may I say something? Absolutely, of course. Yes, sir. Like, I see there's a question from Richard. Hi, Richard. Lovely to see you asking questions. So what <laughs> I think we, uh, we kind of answered right the question we just wanted to say hi you're um, almost answering it. i thought you were just completely still the same wavelength with Richard. <laughs> <laughs> no but what i was gonna say like to i, I feel people that like, we didn't touch this but there's so much power and benefit of using like the massive the big 
so the chat GPTs and the AI into analytics is a powerful tool for analysis. Of course, you need like human review, but I feel as communicators, we should be all embracing this uh, as potential tools, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know, make sure that you're using uh, tools that are keeping up uh, with the evolution of AI for, for language models. I feel that's that's powerful and we yeah. should we should be like of course taking it with a pinch of salt, not trusting everything, but like using the tools that are being developed at the yes. moment. Because that's where we're next as well. Absolutely. And that's a whole probably standalone webinar, a series of webinars on <laughs> AI, <laughs> conversational AI, chat GPT, and where are we going with that? I mean, certainly again, go back to my time in the sector, the next couple of years is probably going to see the biggest change. Um, but used correctly to empower human-led insights, fantastic. And a, a lot of work that can be done there efficiently as well. Um, so, guys, thank you so much. Um, brilliant to have you. So I'm just looking at the comments popping in again. Everyone at Google loves you still, Elisa, which is fantastic to see. Um, yeah. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much for giving up your time. It's always great for us just to get really your perception on what's happening out there from the, from the, the client perspective. So really valuable to us, hopefully valuable to everyone that tuned in uh, to today as well. Um, all of these we to say is thank you for joining us. Uh, do go on the Cometric LinkedIn page, and this isn't a sales push. There's loads of great insight that our marketing team who put this on today, who are really, really good. Uh, they do a lot of analysis, which we post for free, absolutely gratis. You can go on there, have a look, to see some of the latest thoughts, some analysis on plenty of topics. Um, we do have a, uh, a uh, email address info at cometric.com um when we do our marketing outreach quite often we're more than happy to entertain any thoughts from clients uh prospective clients or if you're just looking at the webinar today and thinking i'd be great if i get some information on the conference coming up or particular subjects feel free info at cometric.com ping that through to us sometimes we can even look at doing that as a bit of our marketing outreach as well so always useful uh, to, to get your thoughts on that. Give us a follow. If anyone's still using Twitter, um, it's at Cometric uh, Twitter account. Um, guys, thanks so much. Have a fantastic rest of the week and we shall speak soon. Thank you very much, Matt. Great. Take care, guys. Speak Thank to you later. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks all for joining us. Bye-bye.